welcome to Talent Hub Talk. I am Ben Duncan, and this is a place where prominent and inspirational figures from both the local ANZ and global Southwest Ohana share their stories. In today's episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Sovan and Olivier from Odesava. Sovan is the founder and CEO, and Olivier recently joined the business in Australia as their country manager and head of expert services. In the episode, we discuss how they first met, where they first worked together, and whether or not they expected to be working together again at this stage. We then look at where the idea for Odesava came from, what problem they were solving initially, and how Sovan got the business up and running. We look at why Olivier is so passionate about the data space and the work he has done so far in his career that has led him to joining Odesava. Sovan explains how Odesava have had to adapt and innovate over the years to keep up with the changes that we are seeing with data security and regulations. We discuss what makes data complex and whether there is more to it than purely volume and also explore the Odesava platform and why it is so much more than just data protection. Sovan and Olivier are both highly respected Salesforce CTAs, so we explore the role of a CTA and what Sovan feels a CTA should be focusing their time on and the value they can add to the ecosystem. Finally, we hear more about the data innovation forums that Odesava run and what they are hoping to deliver in the event later this year. I hope you enjoy the episode, and if you do, please do subscribe for future episodes that are coming through. So Sovan, Olivier, thank you very much for joining me. Really excited to have you both on the show. Thank you very much for having us. My pleasure. My pleasure. So I, uh, I, I've i got a lot to cover with you both today, both a, a bit about your backgrounds and, and obviously the business that you are um, with and, and you know you own and, and have recently joined Olivier. So um, yeah, really keen to, to delve into your backgrounds and find a bit more about you and, and the world in which you work. So I guess um, this isn't your first rodeo together. I believe you've, your, your paths crossed um, a number of years ago. Um, just for, for the benefit of listeners that might not know how you, you both know each other and, and came to, to first work together in the sales ecosystem. Um, Olivier, can you set the scene and tell us a bit about the background there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually met with Sovan back in 2011 when I was working at Accenture in Paris. Um, I was leading an initiative at that time around platform as a service, looking at um, you know the value proposition, when and how to use, when not to use PaaS, what skills do we need to build, impact in terms of the way we design architecture. All of that was very interesting for Accenture. Uh, at, at that point in time. And, um, and in that year, um, Schneider Electric awarded a contract to Accenture to deliver a, um, strategic program of work, uh, on Salesforce. And, um, Sovan was the lead architect. Uh, he was, uh, working with, uh, for Salesforce France at the time. And uh, he was the mastermind, uh, behind the, the Salesforce implementation. I remember, um, this Schneider Electric, uh, program as the, largest uh, implementation ever for Accenture in France, and I believe one of the largest in the world. So there was a lot of um, uh, excitement, unknown, um, and uh, interest around this particular program. And um, what I remember meeting Sovan for the first time is um, I was very impressed with the depth of architecture knowledge um, and his composure on such a new technology where, you know, there was so much unknown, um, back in 2011. Um, then I moved to Australia mid, uh, 2011 and I joined Salesforce in 2014. Um, the same year I cleared my CTA in uh, 2016, I actually went to Dreamforce and reconnected with Sovan, uh, at Dreamforce. Um, and I learned more about the solutions. Um, since then, we've been in touch in multiple occasions. Um, we worked together uh, with Odeseva on a couple of uh, large enterprise customers that I worked with uh, in the past few years. Um, they had very strict requirement around security and data protection. They evaluated uh, you know, different options and ended up uh, picking Odeseva. That's how I got into um, learning more about the platform capabilities. And for me, uh, you asked a question about whether, um, we both had the desire to work together. Certainly over the years, um, there was a strong interest growing. And, um, this year, oh, the Siva just celebrated its, uh, 10 year anniversary. So, um, it's good to be there. Um, I'm thrilled to join the company with, um, 
such a hyper growth and uh, yeah, bring the some of the knowledge that I have been acquiring. Um, so uh, working with Oleseva and Sovan in particular, I think is is a um, is a yeah a great way to start twenty twenty two. Yeah, nice, nice. Well, congrats as well on the the, the new role. And uh, Sovan, if we go back to to um to Olivier mentioned, obviously you were leading the engagement with Schneider. So what was your background prior to moving into the Salesforce ecosystem? And, and then I guess also um, you were in this um, lead role and, and then I think your next role out of that was Oda Saver. So um, firstly, what did you do first? And then how did the, the business form? Where did the idea from Oda Saver come from? So I started my career uh, at Capgemini um, as a technical consultant on Cibol, um, the CRM uh, solution from Oracle. And uh, my specialty was CPQ. And uh, I joined Salesforce in 2006 um, as first of all, as a functional architect, and then evolving uh, toward the role of a technical architect. And uh, um, my, like my specialty at Salesforce France was uh, performance and uh, security and uh, helping putting in place the right governance to scale a large enterprise project. But back in 2006, there were not really big projects uh, at the time. And then through the years, uh, we sell for success. Uh, projects became bigger and bigger. And instead of implementing the, the project ourselves at Salesforce, we were relying on the partners. Uh, so my job trans like kind of moved from implementing the projects towards more working with the, with the partners and uh, advising and mm -hmm. uh, uh, helping them scale the projects. Okay, nice. So, um, so then obviously you, you'd spent, you were on these big chunky projects and um, did you, is that where the kind of, uh, you identified the, the gap in the market for Odesaver? So yes, completely. Um, so I was at Salesforce from 2006 to 2012 and uh, multiple of my customers were actually suffering from similar data protection challenges um, from backup to archiving or replication of data at scale. And um, many vendors exist on the App Exchange to address these, uh, these topics, but they were not matching the requirements of the large enterprise. So either they would not go fast enough to manipulate the data or they will be breaking governor limits or they will not be able to support the complexity of the data models um, that the large enterprise has or you know, the level of security was breaking the end-to-end -end encryption requirements. So we were not able to solve the problem and there was a need for a data protection platform that would be able to manage large data volume at scale while protecting governor limits, managing complex data model, and for the large enterprise to, to have the same level of encryption as Salesforce Shield. So um, back in 2012, um, I partnered with Schneider Electric and Salesforce, uh, and this is how Daseva was born. Um, and um, two years later, um, we had the, the backup getting released uh, in 2014. Archiving was released in 2016 and 2018, uh, the year of uh, GDPR getting released. Uh, we released our privacy offering for, for GDPR. And since then, um, we raised $40 million with uh, five different investors, including Salesforce Venture. And uh, we have expanded our enterprise platform uh, with data automation use cases. So if we started with Schneider uh, 10 years ago, today we are super proud to serve more than 100 million Salesforce users uh, from the global Fortune 500 um, with companies like Toyota, Heineken, Dropbox, John Hancock or or NSW uh, Australian government. Well, well, so you you had a like a ready made um, like use case, right? So it, well, you, you had the idea, but but Schneider was there as a partner from the early days to say, right, we you know you help us solve this problem and we'll use the product completely. So what the Schneider was a tremendous partner for us because first of all, they were visionary in the sense that they perceived the gap that there was in the market um, and identifying that. Um, when you have a large data uh, volume context, uh, data does not behave the same. And uh, whenever you address some, some use cases like archiving or backup, the, the data model has a strong impact on how you're going to manipulate the data. Uh, think of it as if we just take the backup and restore. Restore is equivalent to data migration. So if you need to automate data migration in one click, 
uh, it can be pretty complex, especially if you have a complex set of models. So mm -hmm. they were uh, kind of visionary um, and identifying that, first of all, data protection in the cloud is different uh, compared to on-prem, but also that if infrastructure software and platform were automated with an as-a-service approach, yes, pass, SaaS, the concept of data as a whole beyond the data protection was lacking and at some point will kill, will kill the business innovation. Uh, and this analysis of the market became uh, the market study. So I tried for three or four, four years with my team and our partners on the project to address it with the ISVs that were, that were available. Uh, but basically, we identified that, no, they, they were specialized more for the mid-market and less for the enterprise. And basically, that studies became the business uh, study for, for Daseva to be born. And from one thing to another, uh, we have prioritized the use cases at Shanghai at the time and now serving customers across the globe uh, whenever they are super strategic on Salesforce and they have like those huge orgs that needs to, uh, basically a special platform to address mm -hmm. their challenges in terms of data. That makes sense. And Olivier, um, obviously you, you've achieved a lot in the, the Salesforce ecosystem. You're a CTA, you worked with Salesforce for a number of years yourself and you, you were in, involved in some of the biggest projects in, in Australia and, and the biggest challenging um, implementations and and um, you know volume sets and and uh, and everything that that possibly could be thrown at you. So, what what is it about data that particularly piques your interest? And and um, you know because you've you've obviously seen a lot. Why why um, now focus on the data space? Yeah, it's true. Um, I um, you, you know when I started my career at Accenture, um, we had an internal practice. Uh, focusing on building our core technology architect uh, skill set. And um, and I, when I was preparing the interview, I looked at what was the definition we gave at the time? What was the role and responsibility of a technical architect? And um, at the time, they were responsible for designing the execution architecture, development architecture, operation architecture, physical network, and uh, defining and selecting computing platforms. So there was a lot to uh, a lot to cover, and uh, what I've seen over the years, especially with um, uh, SaaS, is that the job of the technology architect has changed, and a lot of these responsibilities have been taken away uh, with SaaS. But at that time, we really had to cover all the um, what was known at the time as the illibilities, so scalability, operability, and things like that. Right. So, um, and, uh, when designing such complex architecture, I, I really always found data, uh, fascinating. It's the heart of the system at the end of, uh, at the end of the day, right? So how you store it, how you protect it, how you scale the, the, the database to support millions of, uh, users connecting to the, to the system, how you monitor it. So data was, I was always been really something that I, uh, enjoyed, um, and found really uh, fascinating. Um, when I look back at some of the things we had to do in the past, if, and if I compare it to now, especially around these execution architecture, dev architecture and operation architecture, I can see that DevOps is actually quite mature and uh, it's usually well covered. Uh, there's you know good understanding how to do uh, DevOps in the Salesforce space, although um, scaling the delivery model with um, multiple teams distributed, not distributed, delivering to the same org or multiple org still has um, it, its fair um, load of challenges. Uh, but there is a growing really maturity in, in this particular space. But if I look at the data and the data ops space in particular, I think there is still a lot to learn and do. And um, and this is one of the reasons why uh, when I was at Salesforce, I became a, a judge on the uh, data management domain. Um, it's part of what we call the, the or Salesforce called the, the nine domains. And this is really the sort of a boot camp to um, help technical architect and aspiring CTAs to build their knowledge uh, all across the, you know, what makes a, um, um, uh, an architecture uh, very successful. So one of the, one of the uh, domain was data. And I was very keen to transfer some of the knowledge that I have been acquiring when uh, building uh, all my custom uh, solutions and um and transfer some of, some of that knowledge around handling that large data volume, um, looking at performance, RTO and RPO. So this, this, this is something that I really, uh, 
wanted to uh, to transfer as much as possible to the to the architect. Now, if I look at the second part of your question uh, uh, about Australia, um, look, what I've learned uh, working with large enterprise customers here uh, in, in Australia when I was at Salesforce is data governance and security is a top focus, is a top priority. And uh, to some extent, I think customers in Australia are quite mature and more mature maybe than other um, uh, geographies on these very specific topic. Whether we talk about internal policies or external regulations uh, that apply to the finance uh, world, for example, with APRA, and um, there is a lot of security uh, policies that the Salesforce architect has to include in, in their design. And see, these security policies apply to the world of data, uh, uh, of course. So whilst Australia has started a little bit later than the rest of the world uh, on Salesforce, um, and therefore there is a, a lag in terms of adoption and skills, uh, I think the, the market is catching up. Uh, but the skills and talent is something that is quite difficult uh, to acquire, you've been uh, in your day to day. You know better than uh, anyone else that um, you know within with within Australia we are under heavy pressure from a talent point of view. Mm -hmm. So, um, but and again, I think this is uh, this is something that uh, I feel we have uh, a lot that we can offer uh, at uh, from at Oraceva to help uh, customers and uh, our partner partners uh, implementing the Salesforce solution to uh, yeah, deliver a solution that work at scale. And scale is actually something that I, this is the other, the other thing that I can see in Australia working uh, at Salesforce is, um, uh, before is the, 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 the deployment and uh, deployments of Salesforce are getting much bigger. Um, and I see customers adopting the Salesforce technologies to support uh, business critical processes. So uh, with that criticality of these apps come the obligation to do what is right with regards to protecting data and uh, protecting data with all these tight requirements that I mentioned uh, before. So I think this this is a this is the this sort of environment um, uh, scale with um, a very strong security requirement that we really thrive. Uh, at Odaseva, and, I, and I'm really, really uh, excited with uh, what's ahead for the company here uh, in Australia. And talking of, of the company, um, so, so then obviously over the years, um, you know, so much will have changed in the data privacy and um, and, and that space. You know, you have um, different countries have different rules and regulations, and um, owning a, a product business and, and running a product business that's used at scale globally um, with so many different use cases or regulations that like how have you been able to innovate and keep up and, and stay on top of of everything and, and keep the product you know at, at the, the front of people's mind so there's two species of data protection and data privacy massively changed um, along the 10 years so if we take data protection first of all um, 10 years ago only visionary customers identified that they needed to run their own data protection strategy on top of what Salesforce was offering. And uh, um, you, you would not even be able to find any articles on it on Garner, on Forrester, on ESG, Enterprise Strategic Group. And now, 10 years later, um, you will not find a single architect who actually does not recommend you to implement a data protection strategy. And you will find dozens of white papers on the topic of uh, on Garner, Forrester, or ESG. So I would say the level of maturity of the industry has tremendously changed and improved. And uh, uh, also something that changed a lot in the data protection world is if Odaseva was created to manage large data volumes, volumes of data has exploded even more. Um, what the LDV used to be something that we would call like 50 million records or 100 million records. And now uh, Odaseva is addressing some customers who have literally billions of record in a single org. Um, so even the concept of LDV has changed. So Odaseva had to continue to, to adapt to the growth of, 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 um, of our customers, the, the growth of our customers to bring more performance, more security, uh, more intelligence to support even more advanced data models. Um, regarding the data privacy space, uh, I would say the, the evolution is even more drastic because back 10 years ago, 
um, regulation defines that we're attached to it, the risk of the repetition on your brand, if you were not complying with the regulation, uh, was basically too low to motivate the ecosystem to invest in it. Whereas GDPR completely changed the, the rules of the game and uh, uh, with uh, heavy uh, fines um, if you don't comply. And also the society in general uh, changed. You don't want to be perceived as a company uh, who do not uh, take uh, into good consideration the, the, the personal information of your consumer. And then CCPA, PIPEDA in Canada, CCPA for California, the Australian privacy law, they accelerated those changes with a modern version of it. And this is a super brand new like industry, literally. Uh, so it's a four years brand new industry. And for the first time, regulation is actually going faster than technology and customers are, are starting to keep up. So Odaseva mission is to uh, basically accelerate innovation to help the large enterprise keep up with those changes and especially around the concept of, um, in, the, in terms of privacy, um, data lifecycle management, data residency management, and data encryption. Mm -hmm. So when, when we talk about like complexity, obviously large data volumes is, is one thing, right? But is that, is that how you would measure um, like a, the complexity of a customer's org and, um, and requirements? Is it purely on how much data is in there or is there more to it than that? From, from, my, from my view, uh, you, you, and this is, a, this is a, an excellent question, Ben, and um, I think you're correctly alluding that uh, this is not just about based on the volume of records. And um, I think with 10 years in the business of Salesforce data protection and now 12 petabytes of uh, data being protected by other we, uh, we We've learned a thing or two. Um, so in addition to the volume, so volume is definitely something that you need to consider, but there's also the weight of these records and all the security around these large table. It matters uh, as much as the, the volume. Um, you know, if you're, if you're manipulating or doing the uh, backup and restore of a custom object with hundreds of fields, including rich text field, uh, well, this is much harder to deal with uh, when you use a Salesforce API compared to a custom object with only a handful of um, numerical or um, you know small text field. And um, um, I would actually invite the audience to uh, look at the session we did at the Data Innovation Forum in 2021. Uh, there's one session by Sovan and Jean-Luc Antoine, who's from Capgemini, and where they talked about the stability and speed of the APIs in the context of mega data volume, right? So this is very interesting to understand how you use um, the um, the APIs to get data out um, in these um, uh, in these scenarios. And uh, <clears throat> so the choice of the APIs, uh, so rest bulk uh, for the right use case, the right mix of these APIs, the the right amount of parallelization uh, is something that is uh, very critical to consider if you want to do the, the backup of these huge table. And um, it's interesting uh, and timely that we, we're talking about that today. Um, there's a new article published uh, this morning by overnight by Francois Lopito, our chief product officer, around the challenges of um, interacting with a SaaS platform using APIs and only APIs. So that, that is obviously specifically around Salesforce, but it's definitely worth a read because I think this is something that the modern technical and technology architect has to um, has to uh, consider. So, in addition to the weight, the the choice of the API, the mix of the API, um, you also need to look into the relationship between the object, the data model complexity, the data skew. So, who owns the which particular uh, records? If you've got uh, millions of record uh, onto this, you know, a handful of users, you, you, you're you getting yourself uh, into some uh, some trouble. Uh, data quality. Um, and I would add, and I would echo something that um, Sovan mentioned just before. If you look at the restore, the restore is very much like a, a data migration. So what could impact a data migration? Well, your you know, the Salesforce practitioners in your audience would be familiar with things around automation. So flows and triggers and validation rules and things like that, um, which 
without um, you know proper governance and the right design this could have also an impact on the rto so uh, particularly when dealing with uh, a restore scenario after you know something bad uh, has happened to your to the platform so it's not just volume yeah yeah absolutely and you've mentioned the platform um right so so the odisaver platform so like I, I think, um, and this is maybe something I've, I've, um, when I've spoken to people in the past about joining Odisaver, maybe I don't articulate that as well as I could. Mm. So for for anyone that you know has heard of Odisaver but but maybe not used it and and has seen it as you know a, a data backup, a, a, a you know a, a product and a tool, why why mm. should it be seen as a platform and um, and and the capabilities that it, it brings on that platform? Yeah, so um, there are probably two angles uh, to to answer this uh, this question. Uh, first one is, you know, at the core, the Odaseva uh, solutions and software and platform have been designed as a platform from the the early days. It had to handle and process a, a very large volume of data, and therefore it had to scale horizontally, vertically with different uh, granular services. So it, it was designed as a platform uh, itself from the early days. And uh, yes, the first um, amongst the first use cases, as you mentioned, there was the backup and restore. But probably the best analogy I can make is if you think about the um, Salesforce and if you think about Force.com, Sales Cloud and Service Cloud, right? So Sales Cloud and Service Cloud are, are sort of a pre-packaged uh, business application and processes that come with um, data models, screens, object, and things like that. Uh, so it is there and you can extend it, uh, but you can also use the force.com platform that underpins uh, the sales cloud and service cloud to implement your own use cases. And that's very similar to the way I see the uh, Odaseva as a, as a platform. Um, we've got about 65 data operations uh, available uh, today on the platform. Some of these have been prepackaged as data apps, similar to you know, Sales Cloud and Service Cloud and Force.com, uh, to cover uh, new use cases, um, analytics, uh, archiving, sandbox anonymization, sandbox seeding, data privacy, cloud replication, uh, are all uh, prepackaged data apps, right? So you can have them, install them, use them, configure, and, and use them. But if you're running your own COE and you have a custom requirement where you can't quite see how these different uh, prepackaged solution uh, will help, you can actually create your own data app by assembling these data operation in your own way. So it's like creating your own recipe uh, and deploying them to the uh, Odaseva platform so that you meet your uh, your own requirements. And, and with that, similar to um, using the force.com if you want to uh, implement a custom app, um, I remember a metric back in the days uh, when I was studying the uh, force.com platform as a service value proposition where Salesforce was... Um, advertising for the right reason that, you know, um, deploying a solution on the force.com would be five times uh, faster than if you had to build it yourself using, um, you know, uh, everything else, but you build everything yourself. So five times faster is a very uh, compelling uh, reason to use the force.com. But it's the same thing, I, I, I believe, with the Odaseva platform. So we've got customers who came for the backup and restore, they explored a different uh, number of data apps, and uh, they had you know, a couple of very specific requirements where the ability to use and assemble the data operation to fulfill their um, custom requirement uh, were very, uh, very appealing to them. And they balance, uh, you know, should we do that on Apex uh, or should we use um, uh, Odaseva? And yeah, at the end, it turned out to be much faster uh, to use uh, with uh, to implement with the Odaseva platform. And um, some of these uh, operations that I mentioned uh, are actually accessible through API as well. So you can integrate those um, uh, additional functionality and extend the Salesforce platform uh, or your DevOps uh, pipeline with the uh, with the API. So you, you look at you know data of the data ops world uh, that I mentioned uh, earlier, which is still you know uh, requiring a lot of work. Uh, well, we've got a solution in that space with the Odaseva data management platform. So 
uh, I, yeah so this is how i would um i would describe the the platform play and there, there's um, obviously emerging use cases as well. Like um, I know, like you, you, Savan, you mentioned that GDPR changed everything, right? And um, I think there's still probably some countries, maybe including Australia, that that might be behind that the the, the curve in terms of um, you know all of the legislation. And, and there obviously there is some red tape, and that there'll be more in the future. But what are the, some of the the kind of edge use cases that you're seeing? Because I, I know um, I caught up with Olivier, and, and we, we discussed some of the the more quirky um, things that that you know are being requested now and you know like customers can request all of their data right in crm mm -hmm. so things like that that, that yeah. maybe people aren't thinking about and and potentially could be using um a product for yeah we were mentioning that gdpr really changed the game because of um the the different level of risk in terms of final repetition but actually the the bigger change that was brought by gdpr and that then influenced the rest of the regulation of the world was that um, the, re the regulation of GDPR is very specific in terms of what you have to do from a technical perspective. Um, it's not just, you know, like uh, legal words into a document and you have to kind of think of what is the impact. So regulation from 1995 in Europe were not that specific on how to protect data, whereas GDPR enter into the details of integrating and availability of the data in the Article 32. But like you mentioned, um, if you take the Article 15, 16, 17, and 18 on the consumer rights, uh, it goes into the details of how consumers can request access to their data, how can they request uh, the deletion of their data. And it's not just about the request, uh, that every time you store those personal information, um, there must be an expiration date. So you cannot keep them for, for life. So let's suppose, you know, like you're going to agree to keep the data for 10 years. It means uh, 10 years later, you need to automatically delete it. Uh, so you cannot send, uh, you know, like a calendar invitation to remind yourself to delete it. So you need to automate those millions of records. Whereas before, you didn't have to. So suddenly the way we are going to store information into the database needs to be tied to those um, to those rules. And after GDPR, every country kind of it launched a wave of, of data privacy regulation moder modernization, and they inspired each other by sharing some similar concept, but they also differ. So for example, um, the Chinese data protection law that, that was released last end of last year require, and that's not something that is being asked in the GDPR for Europe, but the China law requires that you store Chinese personal information. If you do business in the region, even if you are a European or an American or an Australian company, if you do business in China, you must store Chinese personal information in China. And not only that, you can only process this information in China. And what they call processing is view, process, automate. So basically you cannot have Apex code running in, a, in an American data center processing data that will be stored um, in China. So these, as you can tell, like super specific in terms of uh, the, the way you're going to integrate, the way you're going to architect your solution. And that triggers some massive challenges for customers. Like, first of all, how do you store Salesforce data in China? There is no uh, hyperforce uh, um, available there in the region as, as we speak. And even if there were, and if you wanted to collaborate, uh, with your colleagues in the region, how do you kind of avoid the multi the multi org complete separation? How do you collaborate between the teams? So um, this is where Odaseva is helping with the, the the one of the data we released last year, the residence as a service. But what we can see here is as a large enterprise who is doing business around the globe, you cannot afford to develop the compliance country by country uh, in Apex code or, or Java, the, the time of implementation will be too slow compared to the expectation of the regulator, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and the maintenance cost will be even worse. It would it would kill your all innovation uh, across the company. So this is where you need a platform. Uh, you need a platform to install the compliance instead of developing it. And by installing it, then you can configure it, you can maybe adapt it country by country. And if 
the classification of a record is Chinese, then you're going to behave it like this. If the classification of the record is European, then you can apply another data app. But basically relying on software will allow um, a customer through the as a service model to basically keep up with the moving data regulation across the globe and so that they can focus on business the yeah. same way you can focus on your business when you use Salesforce instead of developing a CRM with Java. And it's yeah. uh, it's crazy that you know so many people wouldn't know that, right? So um, you know there, there would be companies out there that would be having engagement with people in China without that knowledge yet. And um, I guess uh, working with companies like yourselves and having that advisory and expert services to kind of coach and guide people on the the, the path to success. But Olivier, um, a bit of a curveball question because I know you're you're going to be building the the team out in um, in, in Australia. So and I know um, globally you have a number of um, CTAs within the the business now. Um, what what do you think makes Odisaver a great company to work for as a technical architect? Not necessarily a CTA, but but as a technical architect coming in to solve big chunky data problems. Um, why would an architect want to do that? Well, precisely because uh, all we do uh, at Odaseva is really helping and uh, customers um, uh, solve their uh, big data problem, the large data volume, uh, and uh, it is quite a unique place to be if you want to explore and understand what it takes to. Um, you know, implement a solution that scale uh, with a um, huge data volume. And, um, you know, when I look at some of the engagement that um, uh, my peers have been uh, helping with, some of them from a data standpoint go from, you know, normal volume to a bit above uh, average volume, uh, but rarely you get to work pretty much all the time on large data. And this is really what we do at, uh, at Odaseva. So if you want to get to know, you know, how and what are some of the challenges to design a Salesforce implementation uh, with billions of uh, data uh, and records, that's, that's, that's at Odaseva. This is what we do. Um, so I think this is a unique opportunity to to work on uh, this particular environment um, together with and I mentioned that before is uh, the, the security around it so it's it's one thing to look at how you deal with large data volume it's also another thing to deal with large data volume in a highly secure uh, um, uh, environment with very strict requirements so this is I think this is quite unique to what we do uh, in, in the company. So um, yeah, if you're a technical architect and you want to get into um, those sort of um, very tricky challenges, this is the place. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned uh, you've got multiple CTAs. And so then I understand you were one of the first, I think the first in Europe, I believe, or one of the first at least. Um, now, obviously, that was a number of years ago now. And, and um, what, what do you think the, the CTAs of today, what, where, where do they fit into the market? Like, What are the problems that they should be solving? So Salesforce, as you know, had um, an amazing growth through the years and use cases have been evolving so much and uh, data have been exploding in terms of volume everywhere. Uh, the different requirements in terms of security has, has been appearing as well. So for, to my perspective, um, the CTA is, is like the PhD of, uh, of Salesforce. And uh, as such, um, we can do research to help the ecosystem scale. So at Odaseva, we specialize our research into the in, in the Salesforce architecture world on the the one of the pillar of the of the city, which is the data architecture, um, like both performance but also security and and the management part of it. So we develop a software to package architect data knowledge into into the platform, but we also share our research with the ecosystem. So how to manage large data volume how to handle different part of the concept of the data privacy regulation, uh, different elements of the security, especially around the encryption. So this is why we, we organize uh, the data innovation forum that, that Olivier was, uh, was mentioning. So I invite every CTA and every architect to, to join us in the data innovation forum. So 
either to just participate and uh, discover those best practices or also to present uh, uh, customer use cases, uh, best practices that you discover during the year so that we can push um, all together the, the boundaries of, of Salesforce data to help the whole ecosystem scale. So, and, and I believe um, that's an annual thing now, right? So there's, um, the, you have plans for the next um, innovation day? Yeah, that's correct. So this year is the second uh, installment. Uh, so we're going to be running the data innovation uh, on October 26 and 27. Um, last year, we hosted 15 sessions delivered by 20 CTAs from our partner ecosystem featuring Salesforce Advisory, IBM, Capgemini, Slalom, Deloitte, Accenture, amongst others, and, and our very own Paul Fell from uh, Deloitte Digital Australia. So these CDAs shared their thought leadership views on the world of uh, Salesforce data, and I, and I really want to thank them for their contribution. So I think this year we are also aiming to do a 15 session around that. Um, and uh, it is actually a very important component for me and for the initiative that I'm driving at uh, Odaseva around architect and partner success. I believe that if we work together, um, the, all the partners within the ecosystem to solve bigger data challenge, uh, we will uh, get better and we will um, architect uh, and design solution that scale really well uh, on Salesforce. So. For the Data Innovation Forum 2022, we already uh, we have opened the registration for speakers, and as a participant, you can already save the seat. Uh, there will be more comments coming and more LinkedIn posts from me and from the Odaseva team. Uh, yeah, and, and it's um, it's obviously all free, so you know you you can attend. Uh, there will be recording post session, but I think it's um, an experience that is uh, great to enjoy uh, live. And um, we've received many expressions of interest already uh, around the globe for speakers. Um, I'm very excited to have Maverick amongst the speakers for, the, for this year. No pressure, Richard and Gary. Um, <laughs> I look forward to your contribution. Um, but there are still a, a lot of uh, slots available. So if you're interested to share your view, give back to the Salesforce architect community at large, and raise your profile in the ecosystem, um, please reach out to me. Um, I will um, post more um, on, on LinkedIn. But yeah, um, this is I, I think this is really a great uh, initiative uh, where people can learn a lot from the, I guess, the elite of the architect from around the globe. Um, so yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's um, you know so key for for people that are coming through the ranks that one day will will face these challenges as well to be involved and to learn from from the people you have. Correct. So you know, last year I know the 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 uh, feedback that we received was was excellent. So I'm excited to see this year as well. So thank you both so much. Um, and uh, I think uh, obviously with with a lot of the user base being in ANZ or the the um, listener base, um, I guess Olivia, you're probably the best person for people to reach out to if they have any questions about the platform and yes, um, you know the, the plans. Um, um, where, where's the best place to contact you? Uh, that's um, that's uh, yeah. Probably uh, follow me on on LinkedIn. Reach out to me, and um, and uh, we can then uh, exchange email and things like that. So uh, I think LinkedIn um, would be the uh, great great place to start. And uh, absolutely, you're you're, uh, you're spot on, uh, Ben. Um, if you have questions from within the region, um, um, yeah, talk to me. And so, and I believe we'll see you in Australia at some point. Yes, um, before the end of the year, for sure. I will be uh, uh, coming to Melbourne and also visiting Sydney to both visit uh, our partners and uh, our customers and our team over there. Well, looking forward to catching up with you when you're here. And uh, yeah, thank you again. Thanks so much. Really enjoyed the chat. Thank you so much, Ben, for hosting us. Uh, we love what you do for the Salesforce community and uh, we wish you um, success in your business. Thank you again. Uh, thank for you very inviting. much. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Bye. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the chat. And if you did, please make sure you have subscribed for future episodes that are coming through. I would also be very grateful if you would consider leaving a review on your chosen podcast platform as five-star reviews will help us to reach more trailblazers from across the world. I look forward to sharing another episode with you soon and thanks again.